Good to see you again. Welcome back. Pyramidal cells, yeah, pyramidal cells. Wow, what a beautiful cells um, and very, very important. So in the last video, if you were listening and watching, as I'm sure you were, uh, we, we discussed the structure of pyramidal cells, yeah? So the pyramidal cells have this pyramidal, pyramid-shaped uh, cell body with an axon coming from the base, basal dendrites like this, and the old apical dendrite reaching up through to the upper layers. So in this uh, video, uh, I want to talk about connectivity between pyramidal cells, how pyramidal cells are connected to each other, and thus how, by extension, columns are connected to each other because pyramidal cells are uh, an important neuron, an important type of neuron uh, within the cortical column and absolutely crucial to understanding psychedelics. So, um, so without further ado, ado? Ado? I don't know. Okay, anyway, without further ado, that's it. Much ado about nothing. Not much ado about nothing at all, actually. Important stuff. Much ado about... <laughs> whatever. Anyway, um, much ado about psychedelics. Could have been the title of the course. Can I check? I can't change it now. Okay. Anyway, okay. Um, so let's look at the connectivity between pyramidal cells. So here I have prepared earlier um, some pyramidal cells for you. Um, so what we actually have here is uh, an imagined um, uh, columns. So the columns I can you can see the the deep and the the superficial layer so we've got the deep sorry, uh, deep layer of the pyramidal of the cortical column uh, in um, yellow and the superficial layer in um, in blue there um, so there is one cortical column now of course I've drawn a single pyramidal cell you can see a single pyramidal cell pyramidal cell uh, but of course in reality there are many pyramidal cells uh, but I'm just illustrating with one so basically we've got three columns here thus and we can see how these columns are connected because we can see how the pyramidal cells are connected so um, we can see the the cell body where the action potential is initiated the action potential travels along out of the column and makes a synaptic connection with, in this case, uh, the basal dendrite uh, of uh, a pyramidal cell in a, another column, a neighboring column or nearby column, or perhaps even a column quite far away, but another column, yeah, another column. So it makes a synaptic connection and that may or may not trigger an action potential in um, this second cortical column. Each ac action potential travels, of course, along its axon and uh, uh, makes a synaptic connection with uh, the basal dendrite of another cortical column uh, and so on so on ad infinitum ad nauseum yeah yeah so this is pretty basic and obvious stuff but it's important so we're seeing here um, connections from kind of deep layers of the cortex to other deep layers, sorry, a deep deep layer of cortical columns to deep layers of other cortical columns, basically. Um, now, there are other, other types of connections which we can look at. Um, so, in this case, uh, we see connections again. However, in this case, the connection is not between the deep layer of uh, the cortical column and the deep layer of another cortical column, but the deep layer of one cortical column um, to uh, the superficial layer of a cortical column. In other words, the action potential is traveling up through the axon, but the axon this time is connected uh, to the apical dendrite. Remember, this is called the apical dendrite. So this is just another way that these cortical columns can be connected. But again, it's the connections between one cortical column and another. Uh, slightly more complicated, we can go even further and look at another type of connectivity. This is a kind of indirect type of connectivity. So one thing we haven't really discussed much, maybe a little bit in one of the earlier units, is um, this kind of pink structure 
um, the base here. Um, and this, this structure is called the thalamus. Um, now the thalamus is a very complex beast. It's about, it's like, it looks like kind of like a walnut. It's about the size of a walnut. Uh, has two halves, just like the, the cortex itself, and it's heavily interconnected with the cortex. And the thalamus has many, many functions. Um, it is a very complex, multifaceted part of the brain. Uh, but one thing that it does uh, is it, 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 it allows different parts of the brain to speak to each other. Um, and one of the ways it does that is through a, a special type of neuron called a relay neuron, um, or types of relay neurons anyway. Uh, so in this case, we can see the, the information is traveling down the axon from the pyramidal cell as usual. But rather than connecting directly to um, uh, the, the basal or, or apical dendrite of uh, another cortical column, it's actually connecting first to the dendrite of one of these relay neurons. This is a relay neuron. Um, uh, which then you know, if it fires an action potential, is going to transmit its information because it's then connected to the uh, the apical dendrite of another um, uh, another cortical another par pyramidal cell in another cortical column. So this is kind of a, a more indirect route. So basically, we've got sort of three ways that we can uh, connect cortical columns together. But ultimately, it's all about uh, information flowing between cortical columns via these synaptic connections between uh, the uh, pyramidal cells. So bearing all that in mind, when you see this now, um, you know what, what this means, right? You have a, a new kind of deeper understanding uh, of what this diagram means. You know now that, for example, when I, when I show this cortical column is connected to this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, uh, that I am, in this case, I'm talking about connections between pyramidal cells coming from this uh, neuron, um, sorry, this cortical column um, to pyramidal cells in other cortical columns. And of course, um, Connections can go in both directions. Connections can go in both directions. I like that. Um, so, for example, we could say that you know, this column is also connected in that direction um, to uh, this um, cortical column. So, so information can flow in, in more than one direction, and, and the direction we haven't really shown uh, here. But you get the picture. OK, so let's... Um, Let's simplify things a little bit and let's have a look at just a handful of columns. So we've just got um, 12 columns here. Uh, so this is easier than looking at the full uh, picture that we normally look at. Um, and let's imagine that a number of these columns are uh, activated, right? So we've got uh, five of these columns which are activated uh, and they might in fact form a connected set of cortical columns. Um, and we know now what exactly what that means, you know, that there are connections perhaps in both directions between these cortical columns um, that are basically connections between uh, pyramidal cells. So uh, we can look at this. So let's, um, for example, let's number three of these columns. We'll look at these three. Ooh, strange. We go. Oh, blue. That'll do. Um, so we got co column one. Um, actually, why not label it like that? There we go. La column one, column two, and column three. Simply because they're nicely. <coughs> oops. Uh, simply because they're nicely lined up like that. And so if we were to look at them kind of side on these columns, um, we might see something like this, right? Um, so we can. Just make it absolutely clear what we're talking about. Here's our columns. And we've got column one, column two, and column three. So they are connected to each other. Um, and of course, if we were to draw the full picture, we would show the other two columns uh, as well. But it's hard to draw in, in more than one dimension uh, in this diagram. OK. So 
so so far we've um, we've kind of thought about um, column connectivity in a kind of a in a an all or nothing fashion, right? So we either say uh, cortical columns are either you know, connected to each other, um, in which case we show kind of a line between them in our you know, in our kind of cortical column bird's eye view, cortical column diagram that we've been using throughout the course, uh, or we'd have no connection. Now that's you know, it's not really very realistic. Um, in the brain, uh, it's it's not kind of a, a binary thing, where either either you know two columns are either connected or not connected. In fact, you have kind of strong connections uh, and and weak connections. So so so. Two columns, these two columns might be very strongly connected, whereas this column is, is, is more weakly connected to some other columns. Um, and, and as we will see, um, it's the it's it, it, it's the it's by controlling the strength of the connections that you can actually control the flow of information. Because neurons that are cortical columns that are strongly connected to each other are more likely to um, are more likely to speak to each other. There's more likely to be active connect, uh, connections, the flow of information between them. And we can actually look at that and, and make sure that that's absolutely clear uh, why that's the case and why that, that makes um, sense. So let's kind of elaborate our picture now and kind of get rid of this false, the false idea that, that either columns are either connected or not connected. So we can kind of, let's elaborate our picture. Okay, so so this is how we've been kind of drawing it before, um, just with our simplified set of six columns, uh, sorry, 12 columns. Uh, so we've got connections between these uh, columns, but no connections between the other columns. That's unrealistic. What's slightly more realistic is a picture like this. Um, and in this picture, uh, we've got um, kind of strong connections with the thick line and these dotted lines are kind of weak, weak connections. Um, and as I said, um, these strongly connected columns are more likely to speak to each other, uh, more likely that information will flow between them. So for example, if, if three of these cortical columns, um, hmm, three of these cortical columns this column, let's say this column and this column are active, then um, this column here will be likely to, more likely to spread its information to pass on action potentials to this column, as will this column. Um, these columns will speak to each other, and this column will also be likely to speak uh, to this column. Uh, and so you get the kind of the completion of this, this particular pattern of activity. Um, and it's it's, it's, this is one of the, the methods that the brain uses to kind of complete its model of the world. You know, so it's receiving patchy and noisy pieces of information all the time, and it kind of completes its model based upon incomplete uh, patterns of information uh, because, uh, because of the, this pattern of connectivity, which allows it to, you know, to complete the picture by uh, activating um, columns that aren't active and thus completing a particular pattern of uh, information. Uh, so this is you know, basically how your brain uh, sculpts your, uh, your reality. Okay, so, so cortical columns can be connected strongly or they can be connected weakly, but what does that mean, Andrew? Yeah? What do you mean strongly connected? What do you mean weakly connected? How can you uh, control the strength of connections between cortical columns? It's absolutely fundamental and uh, critically important that you do do that. Your brain must control the connectivity. You know, we've, if, if there's one thing that we've learned, and we've learned many things in this course so far, but if we one thing we've certainly learned is that sculpting your world model, sculpting the patterns of activation of your cortical columns requires your brain to be able to sculpt, to, to, to generate connections, 
um, to destroy connections, uh, to strengthen and weaken connections between the cortical columns, thus sculpting the flow of information between these cortical columns. So, um, so we need to understand, in other words, uh, how connections can be strengthened and weakened. Um, now, what we know, of course, uh, is that these connections are synaptic connections. So the question then reduces itself to how can we control uh, the strength of the synaptic connection, so pyramidal cell to pyramidal cell, or pyramidal cell to relay to pyramidal cell, if we're going by the thalamus, but we'll forget about that for, for the time being. Uh, how do we control the connections between pyramidal cells? How do we control, uh, really, the connection between synapses? So let's have a look at the connections again and think, see if we can somehow come up with an answer to that little, that little problem. Right, so, um, so here we have our um, columns again, three columns, and we've now established um, that we've got these, these three connections, two connections in this case, sorry, um, between connection between column one and column two, and connection between column two and column uh, three, right? So how can we strengthen the connection? So it's, let's assume these are kind of fairly weak connections. Uh, how do we strengthen them such that we can um, uh, strengthen the, the, the connections between the cortical columns by strengthening the connections between um, the pyramidal cells within the, those columns? Um, now, you might have some ideas, um, but I'm going to tell you how you do it. So there's a number of ways you can do it. One way is to simply increase the number of synapses, right? Um, so in this um, connection on the left between columns one and two, we have a, we have a single synapse um, connecting, whereas between two and three, we have two synapses. Now, why is that going to be a stronger connection? It might seem intuitively obvious that this is a stronger connection. You've got two synapses now, but you need to think a little bit about what these connections are doing. So let's actually do that, right? So, so when, you, when a, uh, a neuron connects to another neuron, that's a badly done neuron. Let me start again. Apologies. Goodness gracious. Um, let's, that's better, much better. Right, so what's actually happening? So we've got um, presynaptic, postsynaptic, we've got a synaptic connection, I won't draw the details. Um, so an action potential, yeah, is coming from the presynaptic. What happens when um, the, um, Blah, 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 blah. What happens when the presynaptic, so the presynaptic and the postsynaptic, uh, releases its neurotransmitters onto the postsynaptic neurons' dendrites? Well, you should know now that you get a little uh, uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential. Yeah, this is all familiar uh, to you. Uh, and now let's elaborate this a little bit. Um, so let's imagine now, um, let's actually redraw this. Um, so just kind of referring back, we had this idea that we have two synapses now, let's say, connecting to the dendrite. Um, so this is, we've got the cell body here of a neuron, uh, and we've got two synaptic boutons as opposed to uh, a single synaptic bouton, which might look like this, right? the axon. Yeah, got it. So here, when when this, um, so let's, so, uh, so we've got single synapse, uh, and this is a, uh, here, uh, double synapse. Sorry, my writing is appalling, but you know what I'm writing, right? Um, so in the single synapse case, it sends its action potential, um, and then the neurotransmitter is transmitted across the synapse and you get a little um, a little uh, EPSP, yeah? EPSP, and that is basically summed by uh, the cell body. It's uh, integrated by the cell body, it kind of travels along here uh, and, and integrated by, absorbed by the cell body. And that's ultimately the cell body is gonna make the decision uh, of, uh, of whether or not the, the axon fires. So what happens when you have two synapses? 
So I should change colors here. So we've got signups up here in yellow and here. So we've got one, two synapses. So, so when this axon travels, so when the action potential travels along this axon, uh, you get a splitting of the action potential, um, which means that you're getting uh, a little EPSP here. You're also getting a little EPSP here. Now, what we know is that EPSPs are indeed summed. So when you actually look at the, the membrane potential, um, in, in this case here, let's zero, zero, resting potential, you get little EPSP like that, yeah? However, in this case, you get because you get two EPSPs, it goes up, and then and you get another EPSP like that. So, in other words, uh, you've got a kind of a maybe a, a double the size EPSP, uh, double the voltage. Maybe, maybe not. Depends on the timing of them, really. Um, but anyway, this this EPSP here is bigger than e this EPSP. And what that means, of course, is that it's pushing the membrane potential closer to the all-important threshold potential, uh, which means that this double synapse is uh, more likely, uh, it's sending a stronger EPSP, generating a stronger EPSP in the postsynaptic cell, making it more likely um, that the postsynaptic cell will fire. Right? So, so that's... Um, um, so that's one way that you can strengthen the synapse, and this is this is sometimes called a type of structural plasticity. So generally, when you're when we're talking about changing the strength of connections between synapses, this is called plasticity. Uh, plasticity referring to the kind of the ability to change the synapse, change uh, the, the strength of the connection. And structural plastic plasticity is when you're actually changing the number of synapses. You're actually changing the wiring, really, uh, of, of, the, of the connections between the pyramidal cells by increasing the number of synapses. However, there are other ways that you can strengthen and weaken these connections, and we'll talk about those in uh, the next video. So I'll see you next for more plasticity. Peace out.